I'm so thrilled to be here with 92NY, which is one of my homes in New York City. Um, I'm coming to you now from my Brooklyn home, um, and I'm going to read uh, from the beginning of this book, I've Had to Think Up a Way to Survive on Trauma, Persistence, and Dolly Parton. Um, I'm just going to read the opening pages um, so you know how it starts, um, and thank you for being here. The first time I remember hearing a Dolly Parton song start to finish was in the triage room of a hospital as I waited to be admitted to a drug rehabilitation program in West Los Angeles. I was 14. It was 1988, and Dolly and Kenny Rogers were singing 1983's Islands in the Stream across LA's Coast FM. I knew her voice, of course. It would have been hard to be anywhere near a radio or television in the last 50 years without getting to know Dolly's warm clarion soprano. But while I grew up on folk songs, basically country for blue states, music like Dolly's was often scorned in my parents' home and by my friends. My friends and I spent our time chasing down heavy metal bands on the Sunset Strip and would not have given Dolly the time of day. Many people of my generation, or at least those born outside the reign of country radio, first knew of Dolly as a straight-talking goofball on The Tonight Show, a set of giant tits, someone your grandma got a kick out of, someone who my father would say with derision was famous for being famous. Meanwhile, Dolly had been churning out hits for decades, possessed of a preternatural talent for writing and for singing authentic emotion into every song. Class and gender stereotypes could not and would not obscure her absolute genius or stop her from going where she wanted to go. I don't remember my parents in the moment they signed me into rehab, nor their probably weary faces younger than my own now, or much of what they said, only that the high cost of hospitalization was mentioned and a joke made about hitting the annual insurance deductible in one night, March 3rd a date I have marked every year in the 30 plus years since. As a parent of a teenager myself now, I assumed there was significant pain involved, some bewilderment, but also perhaps some acknowledgement of this predictable next step in the falling apart sequence I'd been slowly enacting since I was raped by a teenage boy on overgrown 1970s carpeting before I'd turned 10 years old. Now halfway through ninth grade, I had already been expelled from school twice. Reckless behavior followed by variously, un variously successful attempts to cover it up was how I spent my free time while other kids studied or kissed or participated in team sports. I welcomed the stay at Glen Recovery Center. If I couldn't just be given an entirely new self, at least I wanted to make it clear to the world that the one I inhabited was wrecked. Being in rehab seemed like a rubber stamp to that effect. Less fond of cocaine and whiskey than of the exhilaration of forgetting, I craved the fresh environment. My parents filled out intake forms, and I was asked to create a list of people I approved to visit me. I sat with a lined sheet of paper on my lap, even though I knew I didn't want to see anyone. Outside, on Pico Boulevard, the Santa Ana winds blew through the tops of the palm trees visible from the windows of the triage room. I could hear the traffic flow east toward the tall, vacant buildings of downtown after dark and west toward 20th Century Fox Studios and eventually the Pacific Ocean. It was a relief to abandon whatever promise I'd held as a curious, shy girl in my brother's hand-me-down Sears dungarees and a cherished strawberry shortcake turtleneck shirt, the outfit I'd worn to school on picture day a couple months before my body was violated on that deep pile of beige shag carpet. I'd worked hard since then to convince the outside world to join me in giving up on my potential. But Dolly's voice from the hospital ceiling speakers held a different kind of promise than that which I'd failed to meet. It was a release, a renewal, euphoric. When I heard Dolly's voice over the four plus minutes of islands in the stream, I knew I needed to hear it again. Though it would be a few months before I purchased a greatest hits cassette tape from the bargain bin at a thrifty drugs, the multifaceted clarity of her voice hooked me instantly. I needed to feel that euphoria in my body again. I needed to believe in that bright precision, in an artistry as unstoppable as Dolly herself. Resilience, longevity, outlast those who would doubt you, just keep going. 
In my darkest moments, that's been the light she's shown on me. With over 100 singles, 50 albums, 160 million records sold, more than 400 television appearances and scores of awards, Dolly has become even more of an icon in recent years, claimed and reclaimed by fans across a startling number of demographics and featured prominently and with due reverence everywhere from memes and kitsch merchandise to awards shows and a Ken Burns PBS series. Dolly is an icon of feminine strength and yet also an objectified caricature of womanhood. She's super savvy while often playing the rattle brain, a deflection perhaps, a feint of self-protection in a world where big talent and business acumen prove threatening when coming from a woman. She's a phenomenally accomplished artist who giggles it off as she keeps marching forward in five inch heels through the life she wants. She's an American dream. My husband, two daughters, and I arrived in Dollywood, a theme park in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, that is partly owned by and fully named after Dolly in the middle of the worst year of my adult life. A year so horrible that we were pretty sure Dollywood would be a disaster, a fairly expensive disaster, this dream vacation paid for with the remains of a fellowship from the New York Public Library, money I'd earned for once, maybe for always, with my poetry. I'm not great at desks, so I spent that year with my ass on the industrial carpet of the very posh offices of the New York Public Library's Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers, fielding phone calls and texts of crisis more than I spent it working on poems. My grandmother died. My husband's best friend died. My beloved father-in-law had emergency open heart surgery. I suffered with whooping cough for months. My daughter, Ada, in seventh grade, was melting down in ways both predictable and terrifying. I was trying to promote my just-released book of poems about my, tra my own trauma, which in effect kept re-traumatizing me. I needed a break. The afternoon we arrived in East Tennessee, I stood in my rainbow wedge heels on the deck of our rental log cabin overlooking the Great Smoky Mountains, and I let the landscape lap over me. I had never really grasped the rightness of their name, which is derived from the Cherokee Shikonagi, or place of blue smoke, until just that moment. Dense green, hawks soaring toward the sun, then erased by the low, thick clouds that create the illusion of another world, I felt desperate to lose myself in it and to find myself there as well. One of 12 children, Dolly was born in the hills of East Tennessee to Abby Lee and Robert Lee Parton in January of 1946 and grew up in poverty. I grew up the daughter of a college professor and a second grade teacher. My older brother Cliff was my only sibling. Now my brother's family and mine were sharing one of the priciest cabins you can rent at Dollywood, High Hopes. How could I learn to be more Dolly-like, rising again and again from the embers of expectation? What did it mean to be a 44-year-old woman, survivor, mother of two young daughters, a woman with years of missteps and recovery behind me? As a diehard Dolly fan, what did it mean to have finally made it there? I needed the escape of a completely new environment, but I also felt desperate to breathe in the backdrop that had formed the woman who in many ways formed me. I knew it would connect me back to myself and to Dolly. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Hey, Lynn. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure for me to be here. I actually am wearing, although you can't tell, um, the butterfly printed um, jacket that I bought in Dollywood ah. <laughs> at Dolly's closet. Um, uh, so we can talk about that. Another time. But in honor of your book, uh, this spectacular book, and this um, this evening, I, I wore this outfit. Um, I would love to begin, Lynn, from at the very beginning, and to actually talk about your book's title, um, which, of course, no surprise, is from a Dolly Parton song. <laughs> the grass is blue. Yes. And in your converse, and in your writing about that song in the book, you talk about survival as a creative act, mm -hmm. right? That the lyrics kind of portray that. And I'm, you know, in my own work on divas, I, I've learned so much from writers like you about the ways that divas can show so many of us, like they provide models or pathways for survival. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you settled on the title and in particular, the specific, some, maybe a couple of specific ways that Dolly has shown you or us how survival can be a creative act. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, so I, when I was thinking about titling the book, I knew I wanted it to come from a Dolly lyric. I just had to be that. Um, so I, you know, I sort of looked at all of her songs and I was obviously listening to a lot of her music, but this one, it just, it's long. And I'm always like, I write these really long titles for my books, but I, it just had to be this. Um, and it's the, it's the opening lines of her song, The Grass is Blue, from the album, The Grass is Blue, um, which was her, the first of a bluegrass trilogy of albums that she released, um, sort of going back to her roots, as she would say. Um, and so the opening of the song, The Grass is Blue, um, which is about the end of a love affair, um, is I've had to think of a way to survive since you've said it's over, told me goodbye. Um, so, and as I write in the book, you know, the thing that strikes me most about this line is that she says, um, I've had to think up a way to survive because I think like the, the instinct would say, I've ha I have had to think of a way to survive. But I think the of would imply that, that a way to survive exists. Whereas saying up is like, as you say, you know, it, uh, survival is a creative act. You have to, you have to invent survival. Um, and so that's why I love this. And I love those moments where it's just so clear that Dolly Parton is a poet. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, with each word mattering that much. Um, so I love, that's how I, that's how I chose this title. Um, I think, you know, it's been, it was interesting when I began the book, I wasn't completely sure where Dolly and I connected. I knew she was this beacon for me and this sort of rescue and that she, she, you know, sung me through some really hard times and some joyous times and, but I wasn't completely sure uh, exactly um, how she has always rescued me. And I think what I realized was that the example that she gives of thinking up all these ways to survive. For example, I mean, this is just one way that she, she's done it is, you know, when she wrote this Bluegrass album in 1999, her career on mainstream country radio was, was non-existent anymore. You know, she barely chart if at all and she was like you know what I'm just gonna go back to my roots and make the album I want to make and it completely reinvented her career and and that that was one of her ways and I think um, every time I have to sort of you know figure out how I'm going to pick up the pieces or try the next thing um, it's Dolly that I turn to you know it, for big things and and for for smaller things I mean I, I keep laughing that like I wrote the entire book almost through during the pandemic um, and mostly through lockdown. And so like, once again, Dolly comes riding in to rescue me from so And bad. all of us, right? Yeah, <laughs> Rose the <laughs> like, you know, I, I spent the entire, uh, you know, two years of the first years of the pandemic, just thinking about Dolly Parton and listening to her songs. I was like, oh, <laughs> thanks Dolly. It's making it a lot more pleasant. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's continuous with her. And so writing this book really taught me how it was, you know, and, and what she was doing, um, uh, I don't know. She's just sort of this, always this beacon for me. Yeah. That idea of resiliency and reinvention seems so central to Dolly's or her re ability to reinvent, right? Uh, is I think so much part of her yeah. resiliency and her longevity. Absolutely. And I, I, you know, she has this quote that is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, um, I'm sure she states it better, but it's something like, I'm not going to limit myself just because people don't think I can do something else. Yeah, um, and I had that on my mind a lot when I was moving from poetry to prose. I was like, you know what? Good. Dolly, you know what, what would Dolly do? Which is, you know, the constant constant mantra that you know, <laughs> Dolly would write this book of prose. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and that it's. I have a couple of questions actually related to that. And one of them is, you know, your book, like Dolly, moves in some ways across genres. Right? You move so fluidly from memoir to music criticism to cultural analysis and back again, and sometimes all within the sort of one paragraph, which is so exciting for me. Um, how would you define your book and what models did you turn to to create it? Um, how would I define it? I mean, it, it took me a long time to figure out what to call it. Um, I mean, I've always just called it my Dolly book, you know, sort of informally, but that doesn't quite, and I still do, but it doesn't quite cover it. Um, and so then, then I started calling it uh, a book about Dolly Parton, which is also a bit of a memoir. And I was like, no, it's a memoir. That's also a love song to Dolly Parton. <laughs> yes. Um, and so then now I just call it my memoir just to make it easier. I like, you know, on publicity people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there, I feel like there have been, you know, obviously, you know, Hanif's book, um, Go Ahead in the Rain was sort of crucial to my reading. I also read, um, 
Karen Tongston's um, Why Karen Carpenter Matters, which is another book, which is about um, uh, mus- uh, you know, a musician, but also a life and how much, uh, how much our lives intersect with the artists we love, you know, with musicians or any artists we love. Um, and that was really helpful because I saw how she kind of braided things in there. But I think mm-hmm. mostly I just was winging it a lot of the time. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm not a prose writer. I'm not a music critic. I'm not a cultural critic. Let's go. <laughs> 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 and I just kind of, um, I, and I just, I think one of the things that poetry teaches you when you move to prose is how to take all of these disparate things yeah. and put them all together in a small space. And I think that's why my paragraphs end up like that. Because like, no, they're not. <laughs> like it's possible. Yes. It's, it's possible. actually possible. Right, you can take all of these things that are not connected and you just know they are. And if you just keep writing, you're mm-hmm. gonna see how. And, and it was m- miraculous that way. Like every time I was like, how am I gonna connect this story to this thing in my life to what critics are saying? And then they just do because you just write through it. Yeah, there's uh, so many instances where I see a kind of poetic sensibility in the way that you're approaching prose. And um, and I want to get to that a little bit later when we talk about writing more generally. Um, you know, I think that you talk about in the book how uh, in, in many ways the book follows mostly, though not entirely, the order of the playlist mm-hmm. of Dolly songs that you made years ago, right? Yes. And so one question I have is how and why when you decided to follow mostly this order but also kind of the question about what, like what motivated the choices of ordering when you're making a playlist? Mm. And then how did those motivations change when you're thinking about ordering a book? Yeah, that's a good question. So I made this playlist, I guess it was 2012. And when I first got on Spotify. (laughs) And I listen to it all the time. I I highly recommend it (laughs) everyone. I also have one that I call Dolly Addendum, which is other Dolly songs I love, because you can't, she has 3,000 songs, you can't. (laughs) make like a 20 plus uh, long playlist. But I I don't, don't, you know, my playlist making is sort of like a little frantic, as I'm like, I want this song, and I want this song, and I want this song. And then I kind of tend to order playlists the way I would order a book of poems, you know, like what, what follows in an interesting way and gives like new light to this next song, you know, if I start and so that's how I sort of sort of shaped it. Um, And uh, I, you know, I sort of listened to it like that for years. And I started the book and I thought, I'm someone who really thrives with organization. (laughs) Like I just, uh, I know this all seems chaotic, but like I'm telling you, like I'm like really hyper organized. And I didn't think that, I, I felt like I needed a framework to really get into things. Like it, it was comforting to me to think, okay, I'll just go song by song and see what each song brings up for me. Um, and and that's what I did. So, um, you know, um, Steady as the Rain, you know, was written, was first performed by Dolly's sister, Stella Parton. And so I was like, I can talk about siblings, you know, and it was just sort of this kind of thing. Down from Dover uh, is a song about uh, an unwed uh, mother. And I, oh, I can talk about reproductive justice. You know, there was just sort of those kinds of moments. And it just gave me this very, I found it very comforting to have this framework. And then, um, as I revised it um, with your help, um, <laughs> I realized um, that in fact, the order of my playlist and what the chapters became from that playlist weren't serving the book exactly and that I needed to reorder it. So I sort of took a deep breath and reordered my playlist on Spotify because I wanted them to match because I have this problem. <laughs> and then I was like, you can, do, you can get used to this. Uh, and, um, and and then I just sort of switched them around in the same way that I would, would order a book of um, poems, you know, laying all the poems out on the yeah. on the table. I did that with the chapters, and I just thought, what chapters go in what order to tell us which things that will inform later things? And as someone who's never written a whole book of prose, it was a real learning curve for me. I mean, it really took me a while because I'm just used to working with smaller numbers of words (laughs) (laughs) so when you did that reordering was it about like oh i need to make sure i've established these relationships early on in the book or that i need to have a narrative arc even as they're thematic or is that yeah i mean it was both i mean part of it was um the the establishing of relationships because i would sort of bring in characters 
you know, I knew them well. <laughs> my husband, or do I have like, and you're like, wait, she has a husband? I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like, oh, I have to introduce him? <laughs> you guys don't all know Timothy? Yeah. <laughs> nice. so, so, you know, I had to think about that as of like somebody else reading it. Um, and then, yeah, I wanted to create an arc and I wanted the arc to be, because I feel like, um, I mean, like Dolly, I'm relentlessly hopeful and optimistic. And I just feel like there is that happily ever after. <laughs> like, it's just, how I am. And so I um, I wanted the story arc, because a lot of the stuff in the book is so painful, yeah. I wanted the story arc to be hopeful. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't want to, um, you know, I didn't want to uh, like bog the reader down too much. I wanted to sort of intersperse more airy parts with heavier parts yeah. um, and remind us that like even uh, amidst all the bad stuff that hope is there and possible. So that's sort of what I had in mind while I was restructuring it. And it was really good advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, I think what's so beautiful about the book and and I talk about this in a later question too, is that movement between exuberance and restraint and pain, you know, it really does um, do the work that I, you set out to do. So yay. Thank you. yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had mentioned, you've mentioned to me before and you mentioned earlier this, that this was in many ways your first four way into musical mm -hmm. analysis or music criticism, right? You were sort of learning as you were going. Oh, yeah. And I'm wondering how approaching Dolly, these Dolly songs that you have been singing along to for years and years, as a music critic, like what new insights or perspectives you gained on songs you thought you knew so well, like by doing, by looking at them in the kind of musical criticism way, or, you know, or what knowledge you gained listening all those years informed. That's, you know, that's such a good question. Um, I mean, I think that the playlist songs are like, just like tattooed into my brain and my soul <laughs> you know like i just i know i listen to that playlist almost every day for a decade you know it's like i know those songs um so you know that was good to have um just sort of i didn't realize how much i'd been thinking about them until i started mm. writing about them because um you know i just i mean you know you listen to your favorite songs and you move on you don't think about what they're you know what they're actually doing or the construction of them like in in a really present level but i i had been i realized um and then um, as far as like what I, did you ask like what I learned from? Yeah, like if if, if by having to kind of then look at a, a particular song, mm -hmm. I don't know, Down From Dover, whatever the song is, yeah. um, as it, like through the music critic lens, like did it give you a, a new insight or um, perspective on the song and a song that you, you know, you'd been singing all along and you never, <laughs> oh my God, I never really thought about that. Yeah. And that that's maybe why it works on me the way it does because of its, yeah. structure, so, you know, you know, whatever strophic structure, I don't know <laughs> to say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I read, uh, I was very lucky because um, uh, the Lydia Hamsley, uh, um, wrote a book called Unlikely Angel, which was the songs of Dolly Parton. And she's a musicologist. And um, so I'm like, I'm, I mean, I have to admit a lot of like the musicology terms, it's a very academic book, was a little bit over my head, <laughs> but like- It's over those of our heads who were academics, but not musicologists. So right, yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's real. It's like, it's, it's like language. math almost yeah. um, and very fascinating, but it really, I think what I learned, um, you know, reading books like that, thinking about how she constructs her songs and what the construction of the lyrics and the music is doing and how she performs it, it's also intentional. And it just solidified my belief that Dolly is like the most overlooked songwriter of uh, yeah, American yeah. music because she's written so many songs and she is so brilliant at it. And if she had perhaps not been a woman, you know, born in 1946, um, you know, one of 12, she might be more respected um, like, yeah. um, like Bob Dylan, you know, is respected as one of our great songwriters. And um, it, she just, she, you have to remind people over and over. She keeps having to reprove herself and remind people what a genius songwriter she is. And people would be like, oh, wait, that song's really, you're like, yes, it's yeah. been great. <laughs> like it's, it's All these years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's where your, and also your attentiveness to that as a poet really comes yeah. through in the book, you know? Yeah. yeah, you feel that. Like as a poet, when you like dive deep into lyrics and you might know this having written so much about music, you're like, whoa, you know, like this is, 
I mean, she's got like internal rhymes in her songs. I know um, so many. Yeah, they're just like astonishing. <laughs> like I want to be that good. Yeah. It's, it's, I know on a and, Tuesday. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like just like wake <laughs> up and you know like dash off Jolene and I will always love you and on the week. same day on the same napkin <laughs> or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, it's on the it's on the same demo. They're back to back on the demo cassette. So they if they weren't recorded in the same day, they were recorded in the same week at least. You know. Amazing. It's yeah. amazing. You know, um, speaking of Dolly in particular, so in the last chapter, you're right, you ta you're talking, uh, write, uh, writing about different powerful singers who, like Dolly, sang cover versions of Brandi Carlyle's um, yeah. The Story, right? And you write, quote, they can push harder and go louder, but they can't Dollyize it, which is to say they can't make each word so crushingly human that it hurts and soothes at the same time. Oops. Such a beautiful line. Can you tell us more about what it means to dolly eyes a song <laughs> or anything for that matter? Yeah, I mean, I can't, I mean, Dolly invented the word dolly eyes. <laughs> I can't take credit for that. I know, but. That fantastic verb. <laughs> um, Again. The but. act of dolly -ization. Um But I, I think that, you know, in thinking about that song, so you know, like bil big belty singers have covered, like Leanne Rhymes, I think, did right, it, and Kelly know, Clarkson, story. yeah, mm -hmm. Kelly Clarkson. Like, they, you know, they've got these voices, and and they have emotion in their voices. But Dolly has a big belty voice that she also knows when to pull back, and it's so vulnerable, but so sure of itself. You know, its heart mm -hmm. is so yeah. open, great and she. Um, you know, she is feeling what she's singing. Um, she's not feeling the the big beltiness of it. You know, it's not. It's not. A, it's almost not a performance. You know, it's an embodiment of the song. Um, of course, when she said she was going to dollyize this song, she also meant that she was going to sort of take it even higher than what Brandy Carlile, who has it. At, Incredible range had done originally, yeah. <laughs> so she's also kind of like you know I'm like, I'm, a, I'm a diva. I'm, just, I'm taking it somewhere else. Yeah, <laughs> much higher up there with those butterflies. That's true. <laughs> uh, that's you know it's talking as we have about Dolly as this tremendous writer, right, songwriter. I think you know the, your book is so beautifully written, right, and I see it being you know dollyizing the genre in, in your own way, right, through the lyricism and the metaphors, and as I said earlier, your ability to kind of move from exuberance to restraint, sort of like you just described Dolly doing. Mm. And you know, I'm. I mean, there's different moments I can point to. We were talking before we started about this amazing moment on page 161. I don't want to give it away to our readers, but you do this beautiful thing in a paragraph where you're sort of, you change from, you know, you change, you move from like statistics to cultural analysis to a story about yourself, but then not, and then it's it's just amazing. And so I'm wondering, it, you know, for me, it's it's really. Um, a poet's approach to prose, like we talked about earlier, and and also just some really smart ways to talk uh, or write, offering uh, write about trauma, which you do in this book as much as you do, you know, about music. I'm wondering how you think being a poet. You've talked a little bit before, but maybe a little bit more about how being a poet helped you in your approach to both the book and to Dolly's music. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I it is that sort of combining of all the elements that I think I got. And my first um, draft uh, of, not the book, but of the opening chapters when I was still writing the proposal was a lot more like poetic, whereas like, you know, I like drop a little, you know, some song facts and then say something about like something bad that had happened to me, but not want to dwell on it. So I'm like, look over there, there's a <laughs> bird. You know, it's like, and you can do that. You can do that in, poetry <laughs> and, and everyone's like going to read between the lines or not like whatever you don't have to actually dive into it and one of my editors was like you know you have to actually like marinate a bit in the scene and the feeling um in prose I was like okay <laughs> got it um so I kind of tried to combine like the the way that you do have to stay in the moment I think a little more when you're when you're telling a story which makes yeah. sense um but then I also just had so many years of experience of writing poetry that I knew, I just had this, just, I think this instinct that I could connect all these things and I could go from thing to thing to thing and then keep coming back and it would eventually build to a larger um, 
a larger whole that all cohered. I just, it was a gut feeling <laughs> that, that paid off. Um, but I, because I, and I think I got that training from poetry. Yeah, it was a gut feeling and tremendous training, right? Yeah. That, that sort of knows how to circle back to the motif, right? Or, or work accumulatively, yeah. or accumulatively, right? So that at, yeah. by the end, you sort of see the whole. Right, yeah. and also revising. Like I think, all, like I just love to revise. It's my, <laughs> it's my favorite pastime. Yeah. Um, and you know, the act of revising so that all of your parts you can you can switch their order so that they all cohere is just really it's fun <laughs> and it's also very valuable um, as for a writer because you know if you do want to add all of these elements and have a paragraph where you talk about you know your trauma and Dolly's history and you know how a song is uh, composed all you know within five sentences you you have to get those sentences in the right order yeah. And so that's something that also poetry, I think, trained me for. This just ability to look at each word and, and each phrase and sentence like really granularly um, yeah. and, and just get in there, which is, um, you know, why I think, um, you know, in the revision process for this book was so crucial to me, I think, you know, the way you construct a poetry book, right, the way I do is like poem by poem. So you've got the poem exactly where you want it and then you start the next poem. But I'd never done anything where I, what I was revising was like 250 pages long. And that was an experience and it was a learning curve and it was really, really fun because I love revising so much. <laughs> well, but I mean, I think it shows that the book to me, is really the love song to the act of writing and the power that and and in its relationship to survival, right? Like I think both both your own practice, but also Dolly as the songwriter that you know thinks up a way to survive, literally, but just with that phrase. You know, you we have this wonderful moment at, towards the end where you talk. Well, you're talking about that moment you mentioned earlier, where your earphones on and Dolly's piping through, and you're in the lockdown and everybody's on Zoom and everyone's in the apartment. So you go to the, you're sitting on the floor of the hallway and you <laughs> use that moment to also interweave it with the story of Dolly saying like, I can write anywhere. I can, <laughs> you know, wherever I am, I can write, which is true about Dolly yes. but, you know, as a way to show this connection. But it was also a way of showing um, this, this, the, how writing and, and, you know, telling the stories, right. Has gotten you, as you say, gotten you through, through trauma and the writing of about Dolly got you through another trauma, right? Yes. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you see the book maybe as an ode to Dolly as the songwriter or writing more generally, and how that also relates to writing about trauma per se. Yeah. I mean, uh, just quickly I'll say that she wrote her, the Coat of Many Colors, the song on a dry cleaning receipt. So she can she can write anywhere yes. on anything. You know, like it's so beautifully not precious. It's such an <laughs> yeah, and and of course the dry cleaning receipt is now in the the museum at Dollywood. If in case anybody wants to go look for it. Yes. Um, so I think if, to me the story is about um, you know how we get through and how writing um, has been something that I think has gotten both me and Dolly through hard times. Um, writing as one way of storytelling. And I think, um, you know, the more I wrote, the more, because I was telling, you know, I've written a lot about my own stories in my poems before, um, but you know, with the poems, they're, they're a little bit, uh, they're not quite as straightforward. There's always the speaker, you know, it's not necessarily autobiographical, you know, there's all that, like, you know, you're gonna commit to writing a memoir, you're like, oh shit, you know, <laughs> this is true. Okay. Yeah, it actually happened. Okay. Um, so that was a little nerve wracking for me, but the idea of being able to free oneself by truth telling and by storytelling um, felt very, compelling and really great to me and really very much like a relief. Um, and I started to think about how, you know, that's what storytelling does. And, and that's what Dolly is gives to people, I think, this this sort of opening in which to, to that reflects their own lives, that they can then sort of live their own truths, um, you know, like sort of reflected back in her light, I think, um, which, you know, sounds very grand, but I think Dolly would agree with me about that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think are some of your favorite Dolly uh, lyrics? Well, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> certainly that certainly I've had to think of a way to survive my 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 uh very favorite uh 
uh, internal rhyme of hers is from Wildflowers, uh, which is, um, the hills were alive with wildflowers and I was as wild, even wilder than they. Like, yes. that's a poem. <laughs> that's a freaking poem. Absolutely a poem, that, that internal rhyme. Yeah, <laughs> it's just so beautiful. I just, I love that. I, um, uh, there's a there's a line um, in um, "Steady as the Rain" where she's it's it's you know it's this, uh, one of these end of a love affair songs. Um, she has this line: uh, "Once you lived for rolling me, and then your feelings changed." And what I love about that lyric is that like Dolly's like always a little horny. <laughs> so, like, yes. Yeah, so she's like always thinking about sex in some way, and it's like there's it's this is really like. The, the song is like, you know, I can't face the fact that I'm not important in your life. And it's like all of this. And then in the middle of it, she's like, you know, we used to have this really great sex, but then you changed your life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, just, I think that's just like, I don't know, it's so brilliant to me because that's like the thing about Dolly is she's so, you know, she she's sort of uh, someone who embraces pleasure of all kinds. And I, I that's something I love about her. And I think that, that lyric always, I always get a kick out of that one. Absolutely. Or in or in Two Doors Down, when she's like, I'm going to be done sitting around. Yeah. I'm going to go join that party next door, see what I can find. That's right, with the, with the new love that I found. <laughs> You know, it, it's it's speaking about Dolly and pleasure, and I, I think maybe you've answered actually the question I was going to ask is early on from a little bit later in the introduction, I think, it, or maybe in the first chapter, I can't remember where, you you write, you have this wonderful paragraph talking about Dolly, and you say, well, what if she's using rape culture against its own damn self, right? And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how she does that to you, like what that yeah. even means to use rape culture against itself and how specifically. Yeah, I mean, I'm just sort of like to quickly define the idea of rape culture. Right. It's just, you know, it, it's a, it's a, like, it, it's a set of um, sort of practices where, whereby like the, the language we use um, sort of encourages violence against women. Um, you know, the things like calling it like a Hollywood, um, you know, mogul being taken down for violence against women, a sex scandal. You know, it's this idea of like, boys will be boys. Um, you know, things like complimenting, you know, women, you're supposed to take um, street harassment as a compliment after a certain age, because you still got it. It's like, all of that is rape culture. It's a culture that encourages this kind of behavior towards women. Um, and Dolly is so keenly aware of double standards and of sexism. And um, she's also just sort of learned to, she puts on, this costume of the, the woman who's quote asking for it, right? Like she modeled her look on the town sex worker. Like that's, she, she said that in many, many interviews. Um, she, she's assumed this look of a woman who, um, you know, she would, she would use the word trash. I would say someone who, who has been discarded because of her look. And she has taken that on as an armor um, and as a, a vision of success. And she's, you know, and it's, it's almost like it's protected her because you can't say anything about her she hasn't already said about herself. You know, it's like she's just, uh, she's already she's already claimed it. So, you know, it's like she says to Barbara Walters in that terrible interview, uh, which you should all look up on YouTube. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Barbara Walters asks her if she thinks she, uh, you know, if she's a joke and if people think she's a joke. And she says, you know, you know, people that you think the joke's on me, but it's really on them because I know who I am as a person and I'm, I'm happy with who I am. And I think that's what she's done. You know, she's just sort of um, created a, a persona and an armor for herself um, sort of by twisting around the expectations for what a woman who appears like that can be. And then she's gone on to basically rule the world <laughs> in, that, in that armor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating to me. It is fascinating. It, it is. It's. It is. It is tremendous. And and so much ahead of her time in some ways, right? We've so talked much. before in yeah. terms of like what a feminist icon, whether she adopts that word or not. Or I guess more lately she has. Uh, you know what that can mean. Um, yeah, I mean she. Yeah. She only the, the first time I I heard her I identify as a feminist was in 2020 in an, an interview uh, when she was one of Time Magazine's People of the Year. Before that, she would say things like, well, you know, I'm feminine. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and it was a little frustrating. Um, I, you know, she she has often been politically neutral, not always, but often um, because her songs are so damn feminist. You know, I mean, she's got like just because I'm a woman is a song about the double standard, where basically it was inspired by her husband asking her after they'd been married if she'd ever had sex before, and she's she told him the truth, and then he got really upset. <laughs> she was like, "Wait a minute." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So something's not adding up here, you know, and even writing songs about um, unwed mothers who are um, not always judged for that by every character in the song is pretty feminist. You know, she her songs were real responses to things that she grew up around and she grew up, you know, you know, in her town, basically, the women just got married and, you know, started families right out of high school. And she saw all kinds of terrible things that they had to endure. And she wrote against that. And that's her, that was her, that's her activism, really. You know, this sort of very steady uh, feminist activism through her songs for, you know, decades now. Absolutely. You know, you you speak that moment when you say, yeah, that was frustrating. I remember being frustrated in moments as well. And there's another moment in the book where you talk about like Dolly is, is simultaneously like what we wish to be, you know, and yes. also what we are in our failings. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. Like, what were the mom What are the moments where Dolly might disappoint or show us how we can be yeah. fallible, or you know, things like that? For you, yeah, I mean, there have been. You know, I mean, she's 76 years old, and she's been in the public eye <laughs> since um, about the early 60s. You know, no one is gonna. There's, there's no. You don't get through life without making mistakes. And and the thing about Dolly is she's one of the most willing to learn people that like I've read about, you know, I'm thinking she had for many years, this dinner theater attraction called Dolly's Dixie Stampede, um, which is like, uh, I guess, uh, medieval times, but with like the North versus the South, <laughs> it's like some dinner that were really strangely conceived. Um, she really did not know that this would be upsetting to people you know <laughs> she you know for whatever reason like she just never reached her that that would not be comfortable for a lot of people um and then when she when she was made aware of it she changed it to dolly stampede and you know people asked um people asked um like why did you change it and she could have you know hemmed and hawed but she said you know if I'm upsetting people, like as a person, a musician and a businesswoman, I don't want to do that. And so she's just sort of like she takes her mistakes and she just, you know, grows and, and does better as she knows better. And I think that's something extremely admirable. And she will she will apologize sincerely when she's misstepped which I think is all we can hope for ourselves and others. Well, and I think is is hugely important in recent years, right? Because of, I think, a larger culture of um, lack of accountability. You know, I say all the time, like the reason Ted Lasso, the show is so popular is because everyone's always apologizing sincerely in it. And we're like starved for that kind of genuine accountability, you know, that's not in larger culture, especially among certain populations. Of yeah. So I think that that says something. I think that's something that we, you know, are yeah. kind of for perhaps now. And I think that's because I like there's a there's a there was a moment where she had given an interview and she had she was going to do this TV show, but it got canceled. And she she said something which was basically suggesting that Jewish people um, have power, all the power in Hollywood, mm -hmm. which is, you know, a, a constant stereotype. And, you know, as a Jewish person, I was like, oh. But uh, um, she did apologize. She said, I didn't mean to, you know, suggest that, that, you know, I have been on the receiving end of harmful stereotypes. And I certainly feel bad that I did this to somebody else, you know, and I understand it was a mistake. What more can you ask for? You know, like what more could she have done? And it was so sincere. Right. Absolutely. And that's what we want for ourselves, of course. Yeah, right? exactly. yeah, we'll up and then be, you know, that's right. I like to think that I could apologize for my missteps and be forgiven as well. <laughs> God there's many, many mistakes I've made. So I'll ask you one last question. And then there's a couple of questions I have here um, in the chat. And my last question is just simply, is there a particular Dolly song right now that you keep turning back to in your, in your, um, playlist and and why if you want to share that yeah it's it's i do i tend to obsess on songs and my younger daughter's like are you playing that again <laughs> like you know like 25 times in a row but it's a song called raven dove which is on 
2002's Halo and Horns album. Um, and it is an extremely religious Christian song. And I am extremely Jewish. <laughs> we um, listen to this song and you know, it, it, the absolute joy that she finds in this idea. The song is about how there will come a day when you know God will come back, and you know our loved, our, our, you know our, our loved ones who have passed will rise up. And it's all it's very Christian, and it's extremely joyous. And I cannot get to the end of that song without crying. So I'll play it twenty five times in a row, and I'm just crying. <laughs> oh my God, I'm doing this. But it's actually like enjoyable for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We're such poets. I totally understand yeah. that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So there's a couple of questions here. One of them, um, it says, okay, this I, this, I think this is from, from Ricky. Lynn, the book, uh, okay, let's see. The book of your life is now part of the book of Dolly, her archives, her lore. How does it feel to live in that shelf now? Well, I last, what's it, last summer, I took a picture of all of the Dolly books that had come before mine, of which there are a lot. Yeah. And I, and I was like, I just want to, like, I need to retake it and put mine at the top, like the newest, <laughs> the newest entry into, you know, the, the Dolly verse. Um, I feel, you know, I feel really so good that my book can be part of this because I, you know, I, obviously loved and devoured every one of the, you know, books that have um, <laughs> come out about Dolly, but this one really um, celebrates her as a, as a songwriter mm -hmm. so heavily that I'm happy that if I can give that to people and to, uh, uh, to Dolly, that I, I'm so happy to be able to give that gift. And, um, since the book has come out, people keep messaging me and saying, oh, I, I discovered this song, or I, I hadn't really listened to Dolly in this way before. And, you know, that I think has been, I, I, for whatever reason, I hadn't anticipated that. And it's so fantastic. You know, like, which ones are your favorites? You know, which ones did you um, seek out? It's so, it's so wonderful. So I, if I can contribute to, you know, some more downloads for Dolly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I feel like this week for me is light of a clear blue morning because I needed something to like get me through. And my mom, and I just texted my mom earlier today. I'm like, listen to this song. And she's like, how did you know I was sad yeah. today? How did you know I needed this song today? And I'm like, yeah, uh, you know, uh, yeah. I, get it. I get it. That was um, one of my songs on repeat right after the election in 2020. <laughs> I was like, yes. yes. I bet that's exactly right. That was a perfect time to play it. Um, so another question, what if Dolly is listening to this? Is the question. <laughs> Anything you wanna share, I guess? <laughs> um, I, it, it's so, the idea, people, that's one of the most common questions that I get is um, like, have you met her? Or like, what would you do if you met her? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like to me, it's a very strange thing. And maybe you feel this having written about divas. Like I feel like we're best friends. So Dolly, if you're listening, <laughs> we're best friends. <laughs> yes. um, but I also don't, I mean, I would love of course to meet her, but I don't feel the lack of not meeting her because I yeah. feel like we all, we are all Dolly's best friend, you know? And like, and she's just with me all the time. Um, but I mean, I do hope, you know, as I said in, in my acknowledgements, I think Dolly for, you know, giving me, um, you know, all these songs and, and also these wings, like, I feel like she equips her, mm -hmm. her fans and her listeners with wings to soar. Um, and I, that's, so if she's listening, I, that's, that's what I would like to thank her for. Absolutely. You know, you really speak to and, and the way that you use that sort of metaphor throughout when talking about Little Sparrow and the eagles in in Light of a Clear Blue Morning, is, it's really beautiful. And I think you really touch on what I, I find often with divas is like one, they make you feel like you're the, your best, you're their closest and most, you know, ardent fan. Yes. And they also, I think, you know, there's something about so that so that in the end, meeting them or not, is not really the point because right. they sustaining you in this way that both is deeply feels deeply intimate even yeah. as they're 
like such the far away on a day. And I think Dolly in particular, I think it's interesting. I, I was in my divas class, which you visited um, yes. recently. So thank you. Um, we were we we studied Dolly and then Selena just after that. And the thing that both of those I think figures share is both this, in particular, I think maybe different from other divas is this real sense of like authenticity and artifice at mm -hmm. the same time you know? yeah. like they can embody both of those things and maybe it's because of the class markings and all of those kinds of things but i think that adds to the sense of of intimacy or like accessibility yeah. maybe that that put that comes to mind it was early on in the pandemic um i think it was like april like late april 2020 that kenny rogers passed away and mm -hmm. we were all on lockdown and dolly recorded this video from her house because you're all in her house and she's wearing like leopard print pants and like <laughs> these five inch slingbacks and she's like all done up and it's like all that artifice right mm -hmm. like which is just dolly like you you don't go on video without your leopard print pants and your heels and then she speaks about kenny and it's this the most touching thing i say in the book like hearing like her voice cracks and she cries a little bit like hearing dolly cries like hearing a parent cry like it's it's traumatizing <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you can't crack you're the thing holding us together <laughs> but it was like this this real example of divas being both like way larger than life you know because when we mourn our friends we don't usually get dressed up in outfits like that um <laughs> and then also just being very relatable and very down to earth and, and just a very present person emotionally um, mm -hmm. to be able to say what she said. So I think that's just, um, and I think Dolly in particular, I, I often say like I, I uh, in the Dollywood gift shop and you might remember there's, there's like just all these like rows of Dolly's number one fan keychains, <laughs> like just like, <laughs> all of them. Um, and I do feel like everyone who gets one that it is true. Yeah, I feel like everyone is who who buys that and who feels like they are Dolly's number one fan. They are Dolly's number one fan. Yeah. She just has a way of connecting with people that feels so genuine. Um, yeah. yeah. And even amid all of the artifice. Absolutely. And that she allow, I think, encourages us who are often seen as like too much or extra yeah. <laughs> to sort of be in that that moment. One of the moments I also like starred in the book, which has like nothing to do with really like the importance of the book was like when you said you were the only person that maybe was like not except for Dolly, like not underdressed during the lockdown. <laughs> and I'm like, when you talked about like getting all dressed up to go to whatever the. the yeah, party. it was to get my allergy shot. <laughs> Your allergy shot. I thought, oh my God, that was me. Yeah, it was <laughs> because there, you know, there was nowhere to go. And you couldn't go anywhere. So I would put like, on all the outfits. Yeah, you put on your best dress, you put on your best heels, and you go get those allergy shots. Because yes, that is, you know, survival is a creative act. <laughs> Well, yes, you have to feel good. You know, I think Dolly, that's something I've always related to with Dolly. Like yeah. you want to, you know, put on clothing that makes you feel like you can walk through the world with strength. And yeah. And I think the valuing of femme style as strength is something that is 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 key to what Dolly's one of her many superpowers, aside from her amazing songwriting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I feel like she is a champion of that aesthetic. And I feel like it's 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 a look, you know, that I share with my older daughter, which is just a very highly feminine way yeah. of dressing and being in the world, but and it's often disregarded, um, you know, as being less than. And Dolly just proves over and over again, as yeah. she does with her songwriting, <laughs> that you know, That's she's true. almost to be taken seriously. Yeah, so true. Well, I um, want to be, you know, so just express to you how delighted I am to have the opportunity to talk about this book, to promote this book, to tell everyone to please um, read it and share it and delight in it as much as I did. It's beautiful. As I said, ode to Dolly and her various gifts. It's a real a song love song to acts of survival both for you and for so many women out there and i just want to thank you so much for writing it oh thank you and thank you for being such a support and a champion of this book from the beginning and i just want to thank um also uh 92 and for having me and and ricky for for always being in my corner and for for anyone who's watching thank you for taking the time